Hi guys, um, we've made it through your second paper. We're on the home um, stretch here. Um, we're talking this week about the roles of um, the director and the actor. I'm hoping that maybe I can do it all in one video um, or YouTube upload, but we shall see. I might have to split it into two. All right, so talking about the director. This is one of my favorite roles. Um, the director in the theater has a job similar to that of the conductor of an orchestra or the coach of a basketball team. The director is a leader. Although many individuals contribute to the group effort, the director must galvanize the collection of assorted personalities and temperaments into a functioning whole, must inspire as well as unify. As it exists today, the job of director incorporates a number of different types of activities, textual interpretation and artistic conceptualization, coordination of all visuals, and actor coaching. The development of this position in the theater provides a fascinating study in the shifts of power as the interests and values of cultures change. Has someone always been in charge? At the turn of the 20th century, the director emerged as the most powerful artistic figure in theatrical production. The director's authority was the result of considerable artistic struggle, sweeping technological development, the movements of romanticism and realism, and monumental changes in playwriting and acting techniques that swamped the theater in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Actor, playwrights, and company leaders. In many periods, playwrights or actors were in charge of the production of plays. In the classical Greek theater, the playwrights appear to have made various production decisions, selected supporting actors, and coordinated the chorus. By the time of Sophocles, however, most or all of the playwrights had stopped acting and, con and contests for actors were added to the Dionysian festival. By the time of Aristotle and the Hellenistic era, guilds of professional actors headed by an art slash priest, I'm sorry, artist slash priest were in charge of production. In ancient Rome, acting troops usually had a leading actor or manager, but we know little of this person's responsibilities beyond management of the company and making arrangements with government officials for festival performances. Leaders for acting companies in India that performed Sanskrit plays had some stage management and directorial directorial duties, but the record is vague. Actors, both male and female, appear to have been in charge in ancient China and Japan, but again, little detail survives. The Medieval Playmasters. The first indication of the position we today call the director occurred in medieval Europe. In response to the often extravagant, expensive, and crowded productions of the cycle plays, or the biblical dramas, a number of playmasters, who are sometimes called prompters and ordinaries, appeared. Records still exist regarding playmasters from French, Germanic, and English territories. These men coordinated and staged the cycles of their communities. Very good playmasters such as Jean Bouchette in France found themselves in demand and began traveling to stage the cycles of other communities as well. Basically, this guy is so good, let's have him do ours, right? Um, does this make the playmasters the first touring stars? To organize and document the production process, playmasters kept prompt books that might include the play text, drawing of sets, ground plans, stage directions, and various production notes. Important surviving prompt books include one from Val um, Valencians in France dated 1547 and one dated in 1583 from Lucerne in what later became Switzerland. The Passion Play at Lucerne was staged by Renward Sysat, a city government employee. Actor Managers By the 17th and 18th centuries, most Western professional theater companies were led by actor managers such as Moliere in France and Caroline Neuber, one of the earliest female managers in Germany. Actor managers made financial decisions, selected the repertory of plays, hired the actors, and performed. Some were leads and some played secondary roles, but they seem to have had little to do with the staging. Following traditional patterns, most actors controlled the space themselves. Typically in the West, leading actors took center stage with others standing left and right of them or in a semicircle downstage on the apron. Stage business for a particular role, such as the handling of props, was often set by popular performers and passed down to actors who followed. When an actor took over a role made popular by an established company member, he was expected to reproduce the favorite physical moments while adding his own touches to the performance. The lucky actors were the first to do important new roles and thus launched the traditional lines of performance. 
So basically, um, if you were coming in to replace another actor, you had to do it the way that they did it and then add things that were better, but you couldn't come in and give your own representation of that character. So that would kind of suck. In the 19th century in the West, the rules changed with the, com um, with the coming of antiquarianism, the historical accuracy, three-dimensional scenery, local color, very detailed staging directions, and complicated scenic effects demanded first by romantic melodrama and then realism. The situation was further complicated by numerous long runs of single plays by the 1850s rather than the traditional rolling repertory system, which was different plays performed on alternating nights. Combination companies, full productions rather than the individual stars, began touring throughout Europe and North America. To keep track of complex productions and record their work, some actor managers created detailed prompt books complete with historical research. Charles Keane and William Charles McCready in England applied the technique primarily to revivals of Shakespeare's plays in which they starred. Many 19th century prompt books survive in rare book collections such as the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., and some have very detailed stage directions. Productions following these prompt books must have required careful attention to staging and ensemble acting. Throughout the 20th century and up to our own time, most professional directors and their stage managers have continued to work with very detailed prompt books. The Emergence of the Modern Director as long runs of single plays became the norm, scenery, costumes, and acting techniques were developed for specific productions. Artistic power shifted from star actors and managers to people who were masterful at interpreting plays and convincing actors to take direction in order to coordinate the stage effects and acting ensemble. From the ranks of managers, actors, and prompters who fed actors forgotten lines from offstage came a number of directors who at first concentrated on coordinating the theatrical event and organizing the stage pictures. Over time, however, many directors, most of whom were not actors themselves, took charge of the artistic vision. In the early years, especially such um, artistic centralization often led to a dictatorial style in working with actors and designers. This stringent control is evident in the directorial work of W.S. Gilbert, the playwright and librettist of the Gilbert and Sullivan comic operettas. Gilbert was also power was all-powerful in staging his productions and pre-planned actor movement using a miniature model stage, moving his actors about like figurines in a dollhouse. That would just take way too much time. <laughs> but it's amazing. Augustin Daly and David Belasco in the United States, for example, not only wrote their own plays and rewrote those of others, but also cast and rehearsed the actors, created scenic detail, and oversaw all staging. Belasco gave so much attention to lighting the stage that he is considered an innovator in lighting techniques. Nearly all of Belasco's productions and many of Daly's productions were in service to melodrama. In the 1870s and 1880s, an important shift in power and stage detail came from Central Europe in the work of George, Duke of saxe meiningen and his staging assistant, Ludwig Kronig. saxe meiningen was the ruler of a duchy, 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 a small domain, and had a lot of money for production. Because they were running a court theater that was subsidized by a loyal household, saxe meiningen and Kronig felt no commercial pressures and wielded a great deal of authority. They built a remarkable acting ensemble in which all leading actors were also required to take walk-on roles. With unlimited time for rehearsals, Sax Meinigan designed sets and costumes exclusively according to historical accuracy, and Kronig worked out staging in meticulous detail. The resulting productions, especially the innovative crowd scenes, stunned European audiences when the troupe toured with classical and romantic plays. A new standard was set. As playwrights created realistic scripts, Andrei Anton in Paris and Konstantin Stanislavski in Moscow further developed a production style for the new generation of plays. Anton, beginning in 1887, created the model for independent theaters. Small theaters run without the intervention of local authorities that were dedicated to realism and naturalism. Anton often placed furniture along the curtain line and directed his actors to frequently turn their backs to the audience, thus creating fourth wall staging treating the stage space as if it were an enclosed room. The effect for the audience was that of peering in on an actual event rather than witnessing a theatrical performance. Stanislavski focused on the acting ensemble and actor training in his remarkable productions of the naturalistic plays of Anton Chekhov and Maxim Gorky. By the 20th century in the West, directors were fully in charge. 
Interpretation. From a pre-existing text, the artists of the theater, directors, designers, and actors create a construction from all that they recognize as implied or suggested by the text. Interpretation is creating meaning beyond what is literal or obvious in the text. The modern director could be defined as an interpretive artist who attempts to unify the production by coordinating the work of all theatrical artists as they make decisions about possible meaning and signification of dialogue, character, action, scenic location, all aspects of the world of the play. You just did this in your text analysis paper. The director might endeavor to interpret a script carefully and accurately, trying to champion the intent or perceived intent of the playwright. On the other hand, the director may use the script more as a pretext in order to present the, director, the director's own vision or ideas that are inspired or supported by the script. Either approach requires that the text be interpreted through analysis, research, brainstorming, intuition, and experiment. Theoretically, there are many valid interpretations of any play, especially one that is rich in ideas or complicated in dramatic action. Varying interpretations of ideas and characters result in wildly different audience receptions of a play. Shakespeare's Hamlet presents an interesting challenge to interpretation. If Hamlet's, is Hamlet's madness real or pretense? If Hamlet is really losing his mind after confronting the ghost of his father, then his deliberations over the nature of suicide and what lies beyond death must be taken very differently than if he is only pretending madness in order to pursue his revenge. Even specific physical action in a text can be interpreted differently. In Romeo and Juliet, Mercutio is mortally wounded by Tybalt in a street fight. It is clear from the dialogue that Romeo attempts to stop the young men from fighting and comes between them. In that moment, Tybalt stabs Mercutio with his sword. What is not clear is whether the deadly thrust was deliberate or accidental on the part of Tybalt. Directors have interpreted this moment in a variety of ways, most commonly as deliberate, taking advantage of Romeo's intrusion to put an end to Mercutio. But the stabbing might also be interpreted as accidental, caused by confusion resulting from Romeo's good intention in interference. interference. The fight can be staged as adolescent posturing by Mercutio and Tybalt, or as deadly battle with intent to kill. The choice is a critical one. It dynamically alters the emotional import of the scene as well as the nature of Romeo's subsequent challenge and slaying of Tybalt, which results in Romeo's banishment. Interpretation cannot be avoided. Every director, just like every other reader of a play, interprets either consciously or unconsciously. There is no such thing as doing a play straight or a um, of allowing the text to be neutral for whatever interpretation an audience member might wish to give it. Because of the nature of the job, a director should be very conscious of interpretation and find ways to express it to actors and designers as well as receive interpretations of the collaborators. Because plays must be interpreted, no two productions can be the same. Developing the concept. As is suggested by the example of Meyerhold's staging of Hedda Gabler, interpretation leads to concrete choices in production. A concept is made up of the artistic decisions meant to communicate a specific interpretation to the audience. The development of concept can begin well before a director has assembled an artistic team. As a director reads, studies, and analyzes a play, a dramaturge, a literary and historical advisor assigned, specifically to the production, might serve as a consultant and conduct research on the play, author, or historical period. Uh, as the director makes specific interpretive choices, these choices begin to suggest concrete ways of presenting the play. On the other hand, the director can make no conceptual choices until conferences with the designers. Out of their discussion and sharing a vision, the concept begins to emerge. Concept is created visually and orally. It is made manifest in scenery, costume, lighting, tempo, line readings, movement, and composition. The very thing that a director creates, coordinates, or approves. Although an audience is not always certain of a director's interpretation, the audience can always receive the sensory results of concept. Different concepts produce radically different productions. Three 20th century productions of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream demonstrates the variety of concepts possibly for a given play. When Herbert Beerholm Tree directed it in 1901, he saw the play through the eyes of a late Victorian enamored of sentimentalized realism. The forest setting was depicted with scenery cut out and painted to resemble real trees. Audience members supported, er, reported seeing live rabbits and real grass on the stage. The fairy characters supported the gauzy wings and gowns of Victorian children's books. In 1914, Harley Granville Barker startled viewers with the more austere, simplified world on the stage. On a mostly open stage, 
On a mostly open stage, scenery was presentational. Scenic designers Norman Wilkinson and Albert Rutherston created stylized hills and valleys painted on green, translucent draperies. Fairies were given an eerie quality, with skin painted entirely in gold except for brilliant red mouths. Despite Granville Barker's experiment, traditional productions continued with variations on the more realistic approach through the first half of the 20th century. Peter Brook began the conceptual work for his 1970 production of A Midsummer Night's Dream by deciding to strip away not only the details of forest and palace, but also much of the sweetness and eeriness found in so many previous productions. He placed all of the action in a simple white box designed by Sally Jacobs. Trees were suggested by squiggles of plastic tubing, and a catwalk around the top of the set allowed performers who were not on stage to watch the action below in full view of the audience. Inspired by Chinese acrobats, Brooke approached the play like a circus, with acrobatics and trapezes, but without the, garnishes, without the garishness and glitz. Fairies were suspended in the air on the trapezes. The result was a restoration of magic, wonder, and sexuality to the play. The fairies were clad in simple, brightly colored robes. The human lovers wore tie-dyed garments popular in the 1960s. The mischievous Puck delivered a speech while swinging upside down on a trapeze toward the audience. The differing concepts of Beerbohm, Tree, Granville, Barker, and Brooke produced memorable but wildly different sensory experiences for their respective audiences. Communicating and managing the artistic vision. If the artistic vision of a production typically rests with the director in the 21st century, how is that vision communicated to the show's artistic staff, and how in turn is that vision enriched and modified by the collaborating artists? Most directors strive to communicate clearly with all designers and make certain that the separate contributions result in a unified work of art, but the methods for doing so are dynamically different. Meyerhold in Russia was an example of the master artist, the creator or author of the production. Called for by some designers and theorists at the turn of the 20th century, the word auteur is sometimes used for directors who operate with almost total control. Although this way of working is often dictatorial, it does not mean that designers or actors are unimportant. Lyubov Popova, an important early female designer, created a remarkable constructivist set for Meyerhold's the magnanimous cuckold in 1922. It consisted of exposed beams, supports, and movable parts and was not meant to represent anything from the world outside the theater. Meyerhold wanted an abstracted multi-level space on which the actors could work athletically in a highly choreographed style. Popova's work precisely met the vision of the director. Julie Taymor had many talented collaborators for The Lion King in 1997, but perpetuated her vision not only by directing the production, but also by conceiving and designing puppets combined with actors, masks, and costumes. Consequently, her exploration of the world of the play was very hands-on as she sculpted and built models for the masks and puppets. Her co-designer um, for masks and puppets, Michael Curry, concentrated especially on technical design and operation. Scenic designer Richard Hudson and lighting designer Donald Holder worked with Tamor to create a sense of the African environment. Tamor asked for a presentational set that did not hide the way the mechanized set pieces or puppets function, but revealed the ways in which theatrical magic was created. Tony Miola created the sound design, which included the installation of large speakers under the seats of the new Amsterdam theater to create the sound and vibrations of a wild wildebeest stampede. An account of Tamor's period of conceptualization with her fellow artists is published in The Lion King, Pride Rock on Broadway in 1997. Um, the work of Tamor demonstrates a fully collaborative, collaborative spirit and working method, but even in the work of a more autocratic director such as Meyerhold, it is necessary for the director to unify the vision through inspiration, suggestion, and persuasion, not just authority. Collaborating with the playwright. A director often prepares and presents a play with no input from the playwright who created the script. The director's job can be quite different when the playwright is present for pre-production, preparation, and rehearsals. As frequently occurs with the premiere production of a play by a living author, a personal relationship with the playwright can be forged that evokes trust and mutual respect for the text, which is the artistic child of the dramatist. American director Elia Kazan certainly understood this and cultivated a close relationship with two of the most important playwrights of his generation, Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams. He eventually fell out with these artists over both political and artistic conflicts, but for many years he interpreted a numerous modern 
He interpreted numerous modern classics, such as Miller's Death of a Salesman and Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire. When directing Williams' play Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in 1954, Kazan suggested the very positive change of bringing a major character, Big Daddy, back in the last act of the play, but other changes damaged the play's structure. Under Kazan's direction, Williams changed a very ambiguous and unsettling conclusion to one of certainty and sentimentality. When Tennessee Williams later published the play, he included both his own version of the last act and Kazan's version in 1974. Um, Williams created yet a third version, and probably the best, which combined parts of one and two plus new material, and it was directed by Michael Kahn. Sometimes playwrights and directors come to loggerheads, as occurred with Joanne Acolytis in uh, 1984 production of Samuel Beckett's famous Endgame. Uh, the play had been produced many times with the setting called for in the text, an undecorated, nondescript, but dark interior. Acolytus res reset the play in a highly recognizable run-down subway passage. Beckett was so distressed by the resetting that he not only attacked the production, but also tried to have it stopped. Acolytus had not altered any of the dialogue, but Beckett argued that the production's specificity denied the play's ambiguities and thus undercut its potential for expressing the universality of the human condition. Acolytus argued for the director's necessary freedom of expression and the right to conceptualize a theatrical event in whatever way the director chose. The question is not just who owns the rights to a play, but whether anyone owns the rights to interpretation. Such controversy over artistic license, concept, and artistic integrity has been very active for several decades now, with, de with directors sometimes under the critical microscope. All right, directors and absent playwrights. It is more common for directors to create radical concepts when interpreting plays that are no longer under copyright or under the control of the playwright's estate. Directors Tadashi Suzuki and Anne Bogart, like Giorgio Streller before them, frequently revived older work with startling, even remarkable results. Italian director Streller, for example, who is often identified as an exponent of poetic or lyrical realism created an, interpreta an, yeah, an interpretation of Shakespeare the Tempest in the 1980s that was metatheatrical. That is, the production used the play to comment on the nature of performance and the world as theater, ending with a complete collapse of the theatrical scenery. As artistic director of SITI, Bogart launched a new production of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream in 2004, set in the 1930s California. Just another example. Collaborating with designers. Many directors and designers conceive theatrical space, costumes, lighting, and sound through healthy give and take and full collaboration. Typically, the director begins meeting with designers well before casting or rehearsals. The director often brainstorms with designers both separately and together, sharing interpretation, ideas, and images. The director focuses the work of the designers and inspires them to make their own artistic contributions while shaping all of the work into a single unified concept. The artist may take inspiration from many places, but as a whole, the settings, lighting, costumes, and sound combine to produce a style that is unique to that production. Successful collaborations. Ilya, uh, yeah, Elia Kazan's production of Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman in 1949 was a hybrid of realism and presentationalism. The setting designed by Joe Miles Zinner resembled the skeleton of a small house set against the backdrop of a cityscape. There were few walls and little furniture, and downstage of the floor of Willie's house was an open playing space. Yet the selective pieces of furniture were realistic and usable. The costumes were realistic and the acting was realistic following the system of Stanislavski and the group theater of which he had been a founding member. The lighting was selective and in Willie Loman's flashbacks in time the lighting became bizarre, bizarrely yellowish. The production of Death of a Salesman was indicative of much of the work of Kazan and Melziner together. They were clearly a successful team. Once directors and designers find a collaborator in whom they have complete trust and understanding, they are often reluctant to sever that relationship. Such collaborative compatibility is key to the long-term success of many well-known directors and designers of the last century. Seeing in three dimensions. The ability to see theatrical space three-dimensionally is critical for a director. During the planning stages of a production, whether sitting in a theater, examining a set model, or studying a two-dimensional grand plan for the set or sketch for a costume design, the director needs to see in three dimensions. Once a set or costume has been constructed, it is usually too late to change it without great expense and loss of valuable time. 
Directors must be able to see the potential of a design as it will be used in production. They are concerned not only with how a set looks, for example, but also with what kinds of entrances and exits and traffic patterns it provides for actor movement. In the planning stages, the director and design team make decisions that will shape the entire audience experience. Collaborating with actors. Despite the importance of interpreting and conceptualizing as well as negotiating the performance space, the director's work with actors is central to making a show artistically successful. Ultimately, it is the actor with whom the audience will identify and the director's job is not only to choose the actors but also to help them achieve a successful characterization while working together effectively. Casting the show. Casting or selecting the actors for each role is a crucial responsibility for the director. A casting uh, director or a specialist in finding actors for specific roles assists the director in some professional productions. The standard tool for casting is the audition. Auditions vary considerably, but many directors and casting directors want to see unfamiliar actors deliver a prepared audition piece, one or two monologues, speeches from plays, and a few bars from a song. Once the choice of actors have been narrowed, actors may be invited to attend more extensive auditions or callbacks for the director to make specific casting choices. In casting a show, the director considers physical and vocal char characteristics, not only whether an actor seems to fit a role, but also how the actor looks and sounds in relation to other actors available. If the actress playing Juliet is cast first, for example, there might be three actors who could perform Romeo well, but one of them might be the best choice for this particular Juliet. Actors are often asked to read together in various combinations. A physical resemblance could be consideration when actors are to represent a family. The director also must assess more intangible qualities such as talent and range. Will an actor be believable in the specific type of role? Can the actor achieve the intense emotionality, comic timing, or sustained physical activity called for in the script? Finally, the director will consider how the actor works with others. An otherwise talented performer who is not a team player can be devastating to the developmental process. Will the actor take direction or be unwilling to implement suggestions? It is difficult to predict success from a brief acquaintance. Directors often rely on actors they have worked with previously as well as talking to other directors to have the best chance of putting together a cast with the right chemistry to produce an effective working atmosphere as well as exciting relationships on stage. Can I get through the rest? We're going to go for it. Most uh, This is developing character and ensemble. Most directors help actors to develop characterizations. The challenge is to create a unified style for the production while still allowing each actor to explore a role psychologically and emotionally. Coaching the actors often includes discussion of character, background, and motivation. Some directors use improvisation to help actors make uh, discoveries about their characters. For example, leaving the text behind the actors as characters might improvise a scene related to but not actually dramatized in the play. Directors may work when, with masks in rehearsal, even if they will not be used in performance, to explore different qualities of movement and heightened emotion. As individual characterizations develop, the director modulates the performances in relation to one another. Some directors are very successful at molding an acting ensemble, a cast that functions seamlessly together as a unit rather than individual performers. As the director of many of August Wilson's series of plays on the African-American experience in the 20th century, Lloyd Richards created with his actors a wonderful sense of family and community in plays such as The Piano Lesson in 1989, which explores the struggle between two grown siblings. Ensemble is created not only by intelligent casting decisions, but also by the tone set by the director in rehearsal and the scale with which the director can unify the actors in a common performance style. Directors have different ways of relating to performers. Some are very hands-on in guiding the actors. David Belasco, for example, early in the 20th century, would dictate all movement and often act out the roles for the actors. This amount of control may be extreme, but Jose Quintero, a sensitive director of the mid to late 20th century, in directing the plays of Williams and O'Neill, often took on the persona of a character um, as he talked to the actor playing that role. Other directors leave the actors free to make most major discoveries and selections on their own. Arthur Hopkins in the 1920s was masterful at non-interference, giving the actors considerable room and only gently guiding them through very difficult problems. Rather than providing answers, Hopkins preferred to ask questions of the actors regarding character motivation and action that inevitably led to appropriate decisions for the production at hand. 
He believed that his most important responsibility with the roles was in casting brilliantly so that the actors were not only appropriate for the roles, but also able to work together creatively. This model is still followed by many directors. A sensitive director will deal with different actors in various ways. Some performers need a lot of reinforcement and encouragement. Others to respond better to a more business-like approach to criticism. A director may give an experienced actor a freer reign than an apprentice performer. This ability to sense what help the actors need at different stages of a character development is invaluable. Is an invaluable skill for directors. Collaborating with the stage manager. Working closely with the director through the entire production process is the stage manager. Stage managers coordinate a show during rehearsal and performance and keep the director's artistic choices intact during its run. It sounds simple when stated succinctly, but the stage manager is actually the busiest person in the theater, organizing, setting schedules, enforcing rules, solving problems, and generally making sure everything stays on track. Depending on the show's complexity, the stage manager may bring one or several assistants on board. A good stage manager takes care of practical matters so that the director can focus on artistic development. If secured early enough in the production process, the stage manager will organize and run auditions. The stage manager is in charge of preparing the rehearsal space, often unlocking and setting up, including taping out the ground plan of the set on the rehearsal floor and acquiring suitable rehearsal props and furniture. Beginning with the last week or so of rehearsals through final performance, the stage manager serves as the nerve center of the production, calling the show over a headset, giving a warning and a go cue for lighting, sound, and scene changes, as well as warning calls for actors' entrances. Besides having superior organizational skills, a stage manager must be able to work with all kinds of people. The relationship between stage manager and director is often the key to a smoothly functioning production company. Stage managers deal directly with designers, actors, and all technical staff, including run crews, workers who maintain and execute cues for props, costumes, set, lighting, and sound during the run of a show. The stage manager must maintain discipline, as well as keep up morale, be able to think quickly, stay calm, and act decisively. Because of the wide variety of skills involved, good stage managers are highly prized. The Stage Managers Association is a professional organization created as a network for support, for sharing problems, ideas, and stories, and for supporting education. In the days of rolling repertory, when the actors performed in, a di in different shows every night, the prompter sat at the side of the stage or in a special box down center to call out any forgotten lines or stage business. The advent of electrical lighting and electronic sound as well as long rehearsal periods and long runs help to create the stage manager role as it now exists. Sometimes also called a production stage manager, a production manager is usually employed by a theater company with multiple performance spaces such as a resident theater company or a large university theater. The two most important jobs of a production manager are usually scheduling, spaces, rehearsals, and production meetings, and coordinating stage managers for the productions, especially when two or more productions are running and or rehearsing simultaneously. In an educational environment, the production manager is also likely to teach stage management courses and train new stage managers on the job. The rehearsal process. After a show is cast, it goes into rehearsal, the period of work in which the show is made ready for the stage. A four to five week rehearsal period, six days a week, seven hours a day, is typical for professional productions. Educational and community theaters tend to take four to six weeks, five or six days a week, three to four hours a night. The director decides how to use the rehearsal period and each show may be somewhat different. Read through and analysis. Many rehearsals begin with the cast reading the play aloud, followed by a discussion. In some cases, however, the director or playwright might read the play to the cast. Typically, the cast spends at least one or perhaps many days together reading and discussing the play. Other directors prefer to get a play on its feet immediately and begin staging right away. Staging rehearsals. The director is ultimately responsible for staging, combining all elements to bring the text alive in three dimensions. As rehearsals progress, the director sets the blocking. Some directors dictate predetermined blocking to the performers. Others encourage actors to find appropriate character movement while rehearsing a scene, then adjust or redefine that movement. Staging choices can help to create focus on a particular actor or area. If a crowd of people on one side of the stage is turned to face a lone actor, on the other side of the stage, the lone actor usually takes focus. An actor standing in an open doorway tends to be in a powerful visual position. Since the line of the doorway acts as a frame, the position of actors may also suggest power relationships. Staging can also help to tell the story of a play. Even in a wordless scene, a character 
Mounting a series of steps and receiving a crown is clearly assuming a royal position. A balanced or symmetrical stage picture tends to suggest harmony or rigidity. An unbalanced or asymmetrical arrangement can convey the impression of a discord or uneasiness. A director also uses staging simply to create interesting compositions. Part of the sensory pleasure of theater for the audience is the experience of watching shapes in a changing relationship to one another. A triangular composition, for example, is effective in the theater with the most significant person or thing making up the apex of the triangle. Whether beautiful or desolate, the visual images on the stage should be interesting and evocative. In the musical theater, staging is closely related to choreography. Some of the most successful directors have served as both director and choreographer, a combination that not only is helpful in achieving unity of production, but also enables the director to work with the actors in nearly every aspect of their creative process. Bob Fosse served in both capacities for many productions, such as Chicago in 1975, in which his distinctive seductive style um, in both acting and dance with energy and sexuality. In more recent times, director choreographer Susan Stroman has received accolades, including at least five Tony Awards for her stylish, inventive ensemble work in staging and production, such as the musical Contact, um, subtitled Three Short Stories, Oklahoma, and the farcical Mel Brooks musical to producers and Young Frankenstein. Development Rehearsals during the middle weeks of the rehearsal period, the directors work with the cast on developing characterization and refining movement. Usually the set and costumes are being built. While still working most of the time on small pieces of the script, directors often schedule periodic run-throughs in which an actor the entire play is performed without stopping. Run-throughs give actors a sense of the play's dramatic development and rhythm and allow designers to see emerging movement patterns on stage. Technical and dress rehearsals. Near the end of the rehearsal process, light, sound, and set changes are added to the show. During technical rehearsals, the directors, designers, and technical staff experiment with changes in finalized lighting and sound levels, as well as timing for all technical elements and communicate these in detail to the stage manager. Costumes are finally added for dress rehearsals. Some changes in set, lighting, sound, or costumes may occur up to opening night. So opening the production. By the time a production reaches opening night, the director's work is done. The stage manager coordinates the actors and crews as they prepare to do their work in front of the audience. The director, if all has gone well, is left with little to do. Unlike a film director, the director in the theater has no absolute control over the final live performance. Unlike an orchestra conductor or a spo sports coach, the director must ultimately let go of the production and trust the actors and stage manager to do their jobs. Once a professional production has officially opened, the director is supposed to step aside and allow the actors to share the play with an audience without any more adjustments, note giving, or changes. If a problem arises, it must be addressed by the stage manager. Directors in educational theaters often look upon the run of the show as a chance to continue the student's learning process and choose to watch performances and give notes to help the actors improve, but the tweaking by this point should be minimal. Letting the production go can be a very difficult but also exciting shift for the director who has spent so much time with preparation, analysis, and rehearsal. Professional directors and members of the Society of Stage Directors and Choreographers. Um, successful directing requires many skills, the ability to read and analyze written work, to see in three dimensions, to read people and decide how best to help them in their own artistic journey, as well as the ability to lead and organize. It is for a demanding and stressful profession it is a demanding and stressful profession since the director ultimately takes responsibility for the success or failure of any production. Directors are individuals and tend to be strong in a certain area, interpreting text, creating visual images, encouraging ensemble, using space imaginatively. There may be as many directing styles as there are directors and each one touches the lives of everyone involved in the theatrical experience. All right, that is on the director. Uh, stay tuned for the one on the actor.